foreign direct investment driving development. Sustainable growth through knowledge transfer. Technology as a solution. Innovation as a way forward. Over 70 ministers, 140 countries, over 500 exhibitors, 8,000 square meters of exhibition, 15,000 businessmen and investors. The annual investment meeting, sustainable development through FDI-induced innovation and technology transfer. Pleasure to have you all here today. We will be talking about foreign direct investment in agriculture and uh, the related innovation and technological advances that can contribute to that. Um, allow me to start with some uh, introduction on some numbers. By 2050, world population is estimated to be at 9 billion, and uh, it would be necessary to increase agricultural production by 60% to meet the consumption demand of food of this increased population. FAO, that is the institution I work for, the Food and Agriculture Organization, estimates that um, to sustain such increase in agriculture production, an average net investment of 83 billion per year will be necessary. In fact, <clears throat> The current non-cultivated area suitable for cropping, which I mean is non-forested, non-protected, and populated with fewer than 25 persons per kilometer, square kilometer, um, amounts to approximately 440 million hectares. This is, if you think of it, it's almost one third of globally cropped land. More than half of this area, so more than the half of the area that is available for cropping in the future is actually in 10 countries. And six of them are in Africa. Sudan, Democratic Republic of Congo, Mozambique, Madagascar, Chad, Zambia. Sub-Saharan Africa therefore accounts for almost half of the area suitable for cropping. Furthermore, in Africa, there is the potential, there is the highest potential for increased productivity as, as of today, 25% only of the potential productivity is expressed. Therefore, with the support of innovation, with support of technology, it's possible to ripe the harvest of this uh, increased productivity potential. <clears throat> it will be my pleasure today, my name is Pirro Tommaso Perri, to discuss with um, Usama Ahmoud, which is the president of uh, Human Food Division of uh, Dahra Holding, that is a leading player in uh, its sector and has transformed over the past few years from merely a local organization to a multinational enterprise with a lot of investment activities in uh, um, foreign countries and always looking for new initiatives and alliances. Together, I would like to have a word with uh, Joe Yao, Yao um, that is a professor of economics at the New York University and is the director of the Center for Technology and Economic Development. <clears throat> While uh, foreign investment in agriculture is not a completely new trend, the current situation differs from the past when we were uh, looking for uh, farm access and uh, new markets to, and to, uh, to take advantage of cheap labor in Africa. Situation is nowadays completely changed, and in fact it aims at gaining access to natural resources. Um, foreign direct investment is widely seen as an important resource for Africa to fill the financing gap for, uh, for agriculture. Nevertheless, we do not have very reliable data on this. And we need to uh, rely on, on uh, empirical estimates. 
It is reported that uh, acquisitions are concentrated in few countries. A large number of, uh, of, uh, of countries is targeted by foreign investors, but only 11 of them concentrate 70% of the reported targeted area. And again, among these 11 countries, seven of these 11 countries are African. And again, Sudan, Ethiopia, Mozambique, United Republic of Tanzania, Madagascar, Zambia, and Democratic Republic of Congo. Unfortunately, we do not have with us the Minister of uh, um, uh, Investment of, uh, of Sudan, as it was expected. But I would like to use the example of uh, Sudan as a country of reference with great potentials, opportunities, and many challenges. Challenges are represented by the fact that the space where you can invest is, of course, a lot, but in vast areas is underdeveloped. There is lack of infrastructure. Therefore, we see um, contrast between the interest of the investors that, of course, would like to have um, investments in areas that are already developed versus the interest of a country that would need a balance when it comes to investment and regional development. I would like to therefore talk to um, Hussam and ask him what are the principles that you would uh, consider as relevant for investing abroad in agriculture and what are the criteria that countries have to meet for you to be attracted by placing an investment over there. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to start by, uh, by saying that Al Dahra is just uh, a company that uh, has a mandate to uh, create value for, uh, first of all, for the shareholder and for the community. And when we look at investments, we are just simple business people. Uh, we look at uh, profitability, we look at long term, we look how we can do uh, this in a very sustainable way for the business, for the community, and to make it long term. The issues that we usually face, unfortunately, in certain countries that we are looked at as the company, as a CSR activity, we are going there to do everything from scratch. Uh, sometimes we go to uh, countries where they ask us to build uh, water dams, to build roads, to build uh, electricity infrastructure. This is not our core business. We are just uh, agriculture company, we are a trading company, we are processing for foods. Then we expect that where we go, it makes a business sense for the company and for the community and for the country. Then we always look at private and public partnerships. And this is the main criteria where we looked at before we go to any investments. I don't know if I answered your question. Of course, questions. of course you have answered the question. Thank you very much. Um, nevertheless, I would need to highlight that uh, <clears throat> there are situations in which in a country the interest of various groups needs to be taken into account. And often the most vulnerable are, uh, of course, uh, put aside. For this, it is uh, recent of uh, 16 October 2014 that um, the principles for uh, responsible agricultural investments, the principles for uh, responsible investment in agricultural production and food security have been agreed by the Committee on the World Food Security in uh, FAO. FAO is hosting the Secretariat of the Committee together with World Food Program and the IFAD in Rome, but the committee is composed of all the member states. Therefore, global leaders, for the first time in October last year, agreed on a set of principles to take into account the interest of the most vulnerable, to take into account the attention to environmental resources, to climate change, to uh, the need of uh, the various population in, uh, in a country. In fact, um, they represent the first global agreement on what constitutes responsible agriculture in, 
uh, responsible agricultural investment and uh, in food system. Think for a moment at this figure. Only 10% of China is agricultural land. You can crop only on 10% of China, a country with billions of people. That will be increasing. No wonder that there is conflict and uh, competition about land. One way of uh, addressing the problem is, of course, to make sure that there is no competition by having more food. One way of producing more food is not only land expansion, but it's also increase in, in productivity. The increase in productivity can happen through innovation. There is no need of uh, radical discoveries. Maybe a simple transfer is just needed, an adaptation. And um, also, nowadays, with mobile technology advancing, it is possible to arrange for services to farmers. They can call helpline and uh, get advice from agriculture extension. Think that in many African countries, agriculture extension agents are stretched to service up to 4,000 farmers each, which result, of course, in long delays. Mobile technology can, of course, contribute to address this problem. I would like to pose this question to, allow me again to spell it wrongly, your name. That will be Zhao, Yao, I'm getting there. To shed some light on these aspects, please. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, and uh, let me begin, I'll answer your question, but let me begin in a different way. Maybe just to address uh, some of the things you just mentioned. We would love to have you uh, in Africa, uh, in the agricultural sector. Uh, I'm a professor at New York University. Uh, I teach in New York, and also we have a campus here in Abu Dhabi, okay? Um, I have made myself a personal investment even as a professor in agriculture in Africa. Uh, New York University has set up a small center, a research center, in the middle of a rural area. It's a town called Kumu in the Ashanti region of Ghana. It's a place where all the stereotypes you can imagine, little electricity, water, all of those things are there, okay? And yet despite that, I would say for companies like Al Dakra, this is exactly where you should be going. If you're looking for returns on your investment, exceeding the 1% or 2% that you get from the bank, guess where the place you have to go is? Africa. That's where today those who are able to figure out how to make things work, that's where they're gonna get their return, okay? Why do I say that? Number one, uh, as you just mentioned a little earlier, Africa is where all the land is. China is full, Europe is full. Africa, the population density is still extremely low. In the area in which I live, uh, where we have our research center in Ghana, it's a huge amount of land, massive amount of land, tons of water. It flows through what is called the Volta Basin, okay? So there's a lot of water there, there's a lot of land there. Almost everything you'd want for agriculture exists there. Yes, there are problems, there are issues, right? But that's exactly where the opportunity is. If there were no issues there, It'll be like Britain or France, and the rates of return there are tiny, right? It's very hard to make super returns in Europe right now because all those investment opportunities have been taken. Okay, so land is there. Um, increasingly, African countries have high human capital, invested a lot in education. So in this small little town that I just mentioned, the chief of the town is a doctor, medical doctor, trained in Russia. Uh, there's an agronomist in this small town who has 20-something years in Germany as an agronomist, my personal friends, okay? And so in terms of human capital, you're seeing all across Africa a big change. Just yesterday, something significant happened. In Africa's largest democracy, Nigeria, they showed us a change in administration. Peaceful, right? From an incumbent government to an opposition government. This is something we should all salute. Anytime you hear about Africa, it's always in the negative. But this example of Nigeria, I think, is just wonderful. Nigeria is a country to watch. As soon as they get everything, their act together is going to be one of the most spectacular countries 
in the world. Human capital in Nigeria is just awesome, okay? So anyway, that's on the human capital side. And two more points if you just uh, uh, bear with me. Africa has a deficit of infrastructure. In part, it's because of our colonial history. As of 1957, 1960, our colonialists left us with very few roads, very few hospitals, very few schools. Um, we are now building all of those things. So as an investment strategy, infrastructure is a big thing. So a lot of companies are now going to Africa to build roads, to build the dams you mentioned, to build electricity. So companies like Al Dahra, in my opinion, should be partnering with those companies. And so when they go to Africa and they're building the roads and they're building the dams, you can come in, there's plenty of land there. We have what is called the demographic dividend. We have among the youngest populations on the planet. I'm sorry, you're a European uh, from uh, Italy. Where he comes from, everybody's going old, right? In Africa, everybody's young. And so the youth, are going to be doing a lot and the youth are all technologically savvy so now i come to your um, the direct question which you asked which was about uh, technology technology is a way in which we can bridge a lot of the difficulties a company like al dakra would face okay you want to interact with farmers you can't find the farmers but every everybody has a mobile phone you can text them right if you need certain product, if let's say Al Dahra is producing, is uh, creating a processing company. Cassava, here's an idea for you. Cassava is, uh, you all know cassava, manioc, okay? It's a crop that was brought from, I think, uh, after Christopher Columbus in the Americas. They brought cassava from the Americas to Africa. Now a very popular crop. You can use it for glue. You can use it for a whole bunch of things. So go there, have your processing plant, when you want to communicate with the farmers, text messaging. All the farmers, we have developed some apps where you can take the apps, farmers with their phones, they can walk around their farm, and then immediately when they are done, they can beam to us the boundaries of their farm. So you will know the size of their farm. They can take pictures of their farm to tell you that the cassava is growing. This is what you need to do with it, okay? So that's a way in which mobile technologies allow companies like Al Dakhara to go into the bush, places you may be scared to go into because you know nothing about it, and all of a sudden you're communicating with them, maybe even here in Dubai, right? And you can get a picture of an actual farm, an actual farmer in the middle of Africa. That is the power of mobile technology, okay? And so that's why I'm so enthusiastic about Africa, and I will strongly encourage you after this let's talk Go invest in Africa, because that's where you're going to get the major returns for your company. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do see that we are um, at the verge of uh, bridging the missing link that we were maybe discussing, which is private investors that are ready to come and don't find the infrastructure that is needed in order to develop their interests for the mutual benefits of uh, the investing company, of course, but also of the population over there. And uh, the need of a country to provide this infrastructure or these services that mobile technology can complement in uh, many cases. Nevertheless, I see that, um, in a way, seeing is believing. And therefore, even through a triangulation and transfer of technologies that is then extended through extension services, an investor would like to see for real that things happen. FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, often supports uh, government in developing uh, national agricultural investment plans. <clears throat> this was the case of Sudan, in fact, in February this year, that uh, uh, presented to the international community the, uh, uh, the milestones for uh, the implementation of uh, the national agricultural investment plans. Uh, that touches upon enabling environment, institutional reforms, um, of course, addressing resources, constraints, issues, and better support to services and knowledge of management. We mentioned that knowledge is important. In the past, agricultural research was meant to trickle down to the level of the farmers just because it was there. Nowadays, it is understood that extension services are needed and knowledgeable farmers need to be 
um, taught, you need to have an array of capacities that uh, are able to receive the information and therefore build on that knowledge. Technologies, we mentioned mobile technologies, but there are agronomic uh, technologies that can be put in place, like um, good agricultural practices on climate smart agriculture, conservation agriculture, no tillage agriculture that allow the Mozambique to uh, multiply by six the production of, uh, of corn, or uh, integrated pest management, integrated food and fuel technologies. Therefore, I would like to ask uh, Osam, is there any specific technology that you would um, see as um, interesting to invest? I don't know, maybe working in uh, UAE and uh, having uh, quite an interest in uh, water scarcity and water security, new generation greenhouses for uh, closed uh, production. Is there anything specific that you can mention? Before we uh, move to the technology point, I would like to answer one of the concerns of the doctor. Today, people talk about agriculture. Agriculture is 30% of the value chain. A crops in the farm is only 30% of the price of the crop. Still, this crops needs to be moved and put on the international market. And then the other part is to be sold on the international market to get the good and real value. This is very important. Today, farming the right product and have it ex farm has limited value and doesn't have lots of value for companies like us, where we are a global player in 30 different countries. Today, we invest and we farm in 16 different countries. Five of them are in Africa. Then we love Africa. We see lots of potential in Africa. And we keep on working. And we're working on two new projects now in Africa. Then our total investments will be seven countries in Africa. Now, when you look at countries, uh, we have a very successful model in uh, Morocco. And we have here represented from Ministry of Agriculture, where they built a very smart model to Again, as a, a private-public partnership, this is very, very, very important. Al Dahra or any private company cannot do everything by themselves. Anywhere in the world, it's not possible. Even in US, in Europe, in the modern, with modern technology, a company alone cannot do it. It should be a partnership with the public sector. This is to address the problem. Again, the logistics is very important. When we talk about logistics, we talk about collection point, we talk about grading units, we, we talk about putting this on the international specs to capture the whole value. Again, if we farm it and keep it in the land, this has a very limited value and it's not a marketable product. You cannot put it on the market, you cannot capture the value. Then, to go back to the technology, I believe the very simple technology that Africa should invest is, is their logistics infrastructure. When we talk about logistics, we're not talking only about roads. We're talking about ports. We're talking about attracting shipping line at good rate. Today, it's a very expensive to ship product out of Africa and put it on the international market. The logistics part is more than half of the value of the product. Then it's not feasible. Even if you have the best product in the field, Again, you cannot put it on, uh, you cannot send it. And very important point, when you develop this logistics point, I am one of the biggest advocates that Africa is a very, very, very good solution for the food security issue that we have in GCC. Today, GCC, they almost farm nothing. They import 90% of their food. And when we look at East Africa, it's just three, four days sailing from us. Then if we have good farms, we talk about Egypt, Sudan, Mozambique, Tanzania, Ethiopia. These countries have huge potential. GCC countries has the money, they can, we can afford the technology. Africa has the, East Africa has the people, have the land. We can do it together. And again, public-private partnership. Thank you very much. On this note of uh, triangulation of possibility of uh, technology transfer from Asia to Africa through GCC countries for the mutual interest of uh, 
uh, cropping more food and uh, increasing productivity so that uh, the interest of the population in the country are met and the interest of the investors. I would like to have some intervention from the audience or some uh, uh, opportunities of further discussion. Dr. El Tigani Abdallah Badr, I understand, would like to compliment some. Please, there is a microphone for you. If you can introduce yourself on your uh, designation, please. Uh, my name is Dr. Tijani Abdullah Bedr. I am a senior economist, Abu Dhabi Economic uh, Development in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I, am I am very happy to participate in this uh, uh, nice discussion and serious discussion about, uh, about our future. Uh, we have to change the equation. The equation is now we are speaking about the shortage of a lot of things. Uh, Compodium 2030 said the energy loss, we need energy until 2030 by 26%. And food by 25% and water by 60%. This by 2030. This will be a big shortage. The world wants this, but we put the equation, they ask Africa what we are going to do. I give a proposal, as Mr. Uh, Hussam. Mr. Hussam said in his, uh, that they need PPP. What I propose, the interest is for all, all the world. Africa is a part of the world. Africa, says, there is a lot of sacrificing before. That is history. But now, I think if you would like to solve this problem, we put a very clear vision how to be solved. One of them, infrastructure. Infra infrastructure in Africa, most of the African countries are poor. They need finance from abroad. They need technology from abroad. My proposal to make a fund or a bank, international one, just for infrastructure and development in Africa, and can be managed uh, uh, mutually by the members of those people. This can be international organizations, African countries, Arabic countries, and the other countries which are interested to invest in Africa. But if you are uh, still talking about this problem, and cannot agriculture in Africa, yes. Water in Africa, yes. Human, human uh, people also, human are there. All this is yes. But how we can combine them together and put a proper solution for this challenge? This challenge need to make a big infrastructural bank or a fund just especially for the African countries and World Bank and other things can make uh, the, the uh, pro proper implementation for that. Hi, good morning to you. My name is Oli. I'm a senior editor in Al Bayan newspaper. I would like to ask about the your expectation for the food prices and whether the, the, dip, the huge dip in, uh, in oil in oil at the moment will, will reflect in the food prices. Is it a good or bad news for, for, uh, for the prices as well? Thanks. Thank you. Maybe we take uh, another couple of uh, questions or intervention and then uh, we can reply to that. Um, hello, my name is Farah. I'm actually part of the organizing team. My name is Farah Habbas. I'm from the organizing team, but I'm also a student in Shoifat. Uh, and I actually study in Egypt. And I was wondering, since we were talking about um, investing in, in agriculture, and especially in African countries, and we said that if we use agriculture in those countries, we should take it outside the countries for the, the actual use, for to maximize the profit, to maximize the use of such uh, factors. But how can we do that without actually um, using up Africa? How can we make um, the Afri African countries uh, partners with the, the companies that come and invest, not just um, 
manipulate or use up their, their resources. For what we really need in Africa is integration. We have some of the countries that are being used right now for agriculture, the, the benefits aren't going to Africa. How can we maximize the benefits for Africa? How can we protect their countries? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for the questions. I feel that I can um, give a reply on uh, the question on the food prices, for example, to start with. And I would like also to thank Dr. Eltigani for his uh, uh, proposal and intervention. Food prices are, e food prices are expected to um, increase and continue being uh, volatile. Of course, the trend is uh, clearly upward. Nevertheless, the international community is uh, taking this into account. You have to look at the share that, uh, of uh, the household income is nowadays dedicated to food. In some cases, now reaches more than 50%, if not 70%. So not only the food prices are increasing, but uh, the wages that uh, are there in order to afford food remain the same. And therefore, the share that is dedicated to food is increasing. One way of addressing this uh, issue is investment in alternative native crops. There is uh, a lot of potential in uh, stepping out of uh, rice, wheat, um, corn, soya, which are the four most traded crops around the world, and invest, for example, in cassava, quinoa, or other uh, crops that uh, at uh, uh, local level are very um, possible alternative and that uh, would allow you to escape the volatility of the major crops. Is there, uh, I understood that there were a couple of more interventions. I do not want to refrain the audience from, uh, from that. Please. Hello, my name is uh, Raymond Becky. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Investment Promotion Agency of Sierra Leone, West Africa. Um, I want to um, say big thanks to all of you there, and especially Doctor, who says Africa is the future, which I also firmly believe in. Africa is the future for food security and agricultural development. Um, but there is actually a topsy-topic situation here between the demand side of agriculture and then the supply side. And most times, investment promotion agencies or government agencies do come up with very fantastic ideas as to what they do have in their countries. That is from the supply side. That we have cassava, we have ginger, we have pesava, we have etc., etc., oil palm, sugar, and so on and so forth. But the missing link that, is, that I expect to hear probably to seek some help from you here is uh, information is available on the supply side but information is a little bit strained from the demand side. What do I mean? Let's take, for example, various regions in the world demand the same product, but in various standards. If you're exporting oil palm from Africa, oil palm is accepted in China in a kind of different form. Oil palm is accepted in India in a different form, in the Middle East in a different form. All these regions require certain standards for, their, for acceptance of exports uh, into their countries. That information is what is missing, especially from the, from the supply side in African countries. If I want to send food out, what do I send where? One, where is the market? And even if I find the market, what standards are they looking at? What qualifications, what certifications do I need to have? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Once you have the, that information is what is missing. Because most times the mistake African countries do make is they do the inside-out approach, when actually we should be doing the outside-in approach. When I go out there, I know that UAE needs my cassava. They need this type of standards. They need this certification. They need A, B, C, and D. With that information, I cannot go now to my farmers and say, you don't have to grow every kind of cassava. This is the kind of cassava that is needed in UAE. This is the kind of cassava that is needed in China. So I then have a market already before I start production. But most times, it's the reverse. We start production before we actually know what's the requirement. So what I want to know here today is, what's the easiest way 
to get market intelligence for us to be able to brief our farmers what is actually required in the market. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for uh, your uh, notation on the asymmetric information that is uh, in place in the agricultural market. In fact, uh, FAO has uh, the agricultural market information system, AMIS. You can uh, just go on the website of FAO and uh, key in AMIS and you will find a lot of information that uh, will then take you to the various sectors that are uh, of, uh, of, your, uh, of your interest. Of course, it is very important that at local level, the same as uh, the logistics is developed, as we mentioned, also intelligence service is uh, um, extended to the farmers. That step is very much in the hands of uh, the governments, of the, of the nations, of the, um, those that will support that, international organizations, but local governments, local enterprises. We cannot entirely substitute the last effort. You see, in a way, it is very important that the knowledge rests on a capacity that is able to absorb this knowledge, and that is very crucial also with the mention on education and uh, uh, the ability to absorb innovation. But I do have still a question that we need to answer on how we can maximize the benefit for, uh, for Africa. Maybe you started with an example of activities that you were directly involved. You want to, Zhao, to uh, address this question, please. Yeah, so um, hopefully this is still on, yeah. So let me, let me address the question in the following way. Um, first of all, um, al-Dakhra, the conversation earlier on, um, one thing we should all understand is that Africa itself is a huge market. You've got a billion people plus over there. I think it's, it's either Alda or MR have just spent several billion dollars on this. Um, they have a housing project outside of Abuja, right? And this is a, MI is a, is, a, is, a, is a big company here. And they've put their bet in Nigeria, and they've got this housing complex for upper middle class people, all right? So this is a way in which things will benefit the country itself. Um, I think when companies go to Africa and tell themselves that they will succeed, they will. And so I think you were asking the question earlier on about how, um, how we can make this of benefit to Africans themselves. And the point is just that Africa itself is a huge market. I am old enough to remember when we were beginning the mobile phone revolution. And mobile phones were coming in the Western world and everybody said, oh, Africa is impossible, right? There's corruption, the infrastructure is not there, etc., etc. Those people who went first into Africa on mobile phones have made billions, billions. Vodafone today, MTN today, um, uh, a lot of these, Moi Ibrahim, all these people have made billions of dollars because they said we can make money there. If you go to Ghana, Nigeria, Congo, the lights are out, but the mobile phones still work, okay? And so the point I'm driving at is let's always focus on that one point something million, billion people who are in Africa today, firms can make a lot of money, Africans can be helped. I disagree that, I think it was your question about information. So long as there's a business opportunity there, trust the Africans to figure it out. We just, uh, we've written a, we're in the process of writing a book on cocoa. Let's remember the story of cocoa in West Africa. Cocoa is a crop that was brought from the New World into countries like Ghana and Ivory Coast. When it came there, Africans did not know what cocoa was for. People in Africa did not consume chocolate. Many of us to this day do not have a sweet tooth for chocolate, okay? And yet, the people were able to figure out that there's an external market for cocoa, and they produced this crop. When cocoa first came into Ghana, for example, 1876, a lot of the farmers, this was the time when the uh, automobile was coming. And so they were using 
gasoline for the automobiles. Many Ghanaians thought that the cocoa was used by the white man to make gasoline, right? The point is just that they didn't know exactly what it was for, and yet they created over about 20, 30 years, one third of the cocoa crop in the world. Trust the Africans, if there's a business opportunity there, they will figure out all the standards and all of those things. Thank you very much. On this uh, note, and maybe I can take as a, your uh, final statement, yeah. I would like to mention some uh, key words that we addressed today before leaving the floor to Hussam for his uh, final statement. First, there is no need to have radical discoveries. Technology, knowledge, innovation is already there and possibly only needs an adaptation in uh, Africa. Mobile technology is very important. Capacity, knowledge, logistics is another word of, uh, that, that was recurrent in our discussion today, and specifications and information, plus, of course, infrastructure development. Please, Usam, if you have any final word for us. I would like to start by answering uh, Albanian newspaper. The, uh, the price of food today is not only energy. The energy is part of it. But what we have to track in order to know what's the biggest impact on the food price is the uh, change in habits for people. What do they eat? If you look today at a country like China, the Chinese people are becoming richer. They're changing their food habit. They're putting pressure. This is put pressure on the prices. Indian people, if they change their food habits and move to protein tomorrow, we will have a problem with the price of meat. This is what's really, this, I believe, this is the biggest impact on the food price. The oil is, is part of it, but it's not the biggest influence. Again, the, if the way we look at it in Al Dahra, we try to look at it from different angles. We try to go to the market, uh, find what they have best and take it to the best paying market where they need this product more. And again, this is about information. And information, we gather it, we go and knock the door of our customers and check what's happening around and what do they need and how we can adjust. Um, again, I, I don't believe in, in big mega projects where we need uh, billions of dollars to do things. I, I think we just need smart people, uh, engaged people, uh, entrepreneurs, give the opportunity to, to small farmers to create something, put logistics platform where these farmers can be able to uh, put their, this product on international market. And when people know that there is real value for this product, I think there will be less wastage. When I know that this product is valuable, I will think 10 times before I waste this product. And this 30% number will go lower and lower. If I know there is value, if I know that I can sell it and, and monetize this, this, this product. And when we talk about uh, food shortage by 2030 or 2050, we don't see this. I think in, uh, 19, uh, in 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, everybody talks about food shortage. But there is no food shortage. Again, if we farm Africa, I think we can feed the, the earth and all the planets around. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, notation. And thank you very much for mentioning the diet composition uh, importance, as uh, that would have also a huge impact on the natural resource use. But that is possibly the subject of, uh, of, another, uh, of another panel. In fact, you also correctly stressed that uh, it is not a matter of food shortage. Even during the food crisis, food, after all, throughout the world was never scarce. It was the perception of the scarcity of the food that triggered the price spike. Think of it. You think that tomorrow you will be starving. No matter if you have or not have the food, as soon as you are worried about that, you will start buying. Of course, this happens in the households, it happens at government level in order to meet the needs of the constituencies. So, we need to pay also attention to the behavior and the expectations of people and the constituencies. After all, it is very important that farmers farm with also some money in their pocket, which makes that 
job is very much needed, capacity to take advantage of the opportunities that is there in Africa has to be uh, fostered. I would like to thank you very much for uh, being with us today. I would like to thank Hussam Mahmoud and uh, Jao. Finally, I got it right. Thank you very much for being with us. Have a good thank day. Thank you. Bye.